There are a bunch of islands that the United States owns at the very edge of this map, deep into the Pacific, like out here, and they all say like a little US next to them. They're teeny tiny islands where no one lives and they're just in the middle of the Pacific, so far away from the actual United States. Why do we own all these weird islands? What happened? Well, it has to do with farming and bird poop. Back in the old days, farming looked like this. Basically just small groups of people, usually a few families, that would grow food for their community, and that was about it. But soon the world started to change, and started to look a lot less like this, and a lot more like this. People started moving into the city and working in factories, mass producing commodities and items that would be shipped all around the world. And suddenly, farmers had an incentive and a duty to make more food, to ship it to these non-farm workers who are now living in cities. Farms started specializing in one crop, like corn or wheat. And they were able to sell their crops not only to their local markets, but to markets all around the world. But there's a problem here. When you're a farmer and you're producing the same crop year after year, your soil starts to lose its nutrients. It doesn't have time to regenerate. And it eventually becomes completely exhausted, making it impossible for you to produce in abundance. And if you can't make food in abundance, then you can't feed these ever-growing cities of people who are working in factories. And then the global economy starts to break down and the whole thing stops. For a moment there in the 1800s, it was looking like Earth would not be able to sustain a population over like two and a half billion people because there wasn't enough nutrients in the soil to keep up with the demand for food. But luckily there was a solution to this soil nutrients problem. And that solution looked like this. One of Animal waste from any animal is packed with the nutrients that the soil needs to rejuvenate itself to grow more crops year after year. Another term for this is fertilizer. And so now we're talking about farms and industrialization and fertilizer, and you're probably thinking, this is a boring story. But these simple facts led the United States to expand well beyond the borders that we think of the United States today. To colonize far-flung islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean, all in search of one special commodity. Bird shit. So it's the mid 1800s, and like I said, these farmers are growing a ton of a single crop, sending it mainly to cities to be consumed. Now, before all of this urbanization, when people would eat this food, the waste that they would produce would be captured and brought back onto the field, which would help rejuvenate the nutrients in the field and allow them to continue to grow in this sort of sustainable cycle. But now, all of that human waste was being piped into sewage systems and then sent out to rivers and to the ocean, completely lost. One estimate said that every year, $50 million worth of valuable fertilizer was just wasted away through the sewer system. And this is where the bird shit comes in. If you go down to Peru and look right off the coast, you're gonna see a few islands. These are little more than just some rocks in the middle of the ocean that were totally uninhabited. Well, I guess they were inhabited, just not by humans, but by birds. These birds spend their day eating fish from the ocean around the rocks, inevitably dropping their waste. Pair this with the fact that these rocks don't get a lot of rain. So instead, this bird dung just sits there day after day, year after year, baking in the sun, and eventually it becomes like rock hard. You can imagine that after thousands of years of this process, you start to get some pretty thick layers of bird shit these deposits would get up to 60 meters. That's like the size of this random building in Argentina that I found on the internet. The building's not important. The height is. This calcified bird poop is called guano, and it contains exactly what the farmers in the United States needed to continue with the demand for more and more food in the cities. Because again, bird and animal waste is full of chemical properties like nitrogen that are vital for regenerating soil, meaning they're good fertilizer. Once this guano was discovered, 
there was a race for everyone around the world to get their hands on it. Soon in the United States, guano became this like mythical, magical substance. There's all these tall tales that pop up where like this dad leaves his kid in the shed where the guano is contained and he opens the shed an hour later and the kid is now a full grown man with facial hair. <laughs> or the farmer who sprinkles guano on his cucumbers and the vines of the cucumbers pop up and start to like attack the man. I mean, it's just, this is crazy. It's obviously not fact-based or true, but it gave a sense that there was this craze that guano was going to be the savior of all of the farmer's issues in the United States. So inevitably, an economy and a trade around guano emerged. And as always at this time, the British got there first. So there was a British firm that had a monopoly over all the guano trade from these islands in Peru, which was sort of the best known place for guano at the time. So with this one British firm controlling the whole guano trade and demand surging, the prices skyrocketed, making it way more expensive for American farmers to get their hands on this amazing stuff. So who steps in to solve this issue? The president of the United States. In his first State of the Union address, President Fillmore gets up and talks about guano. He says that, quote, Peruvian guano has become so desirable an article that he felt it, quote, the duty of the government to secure it at a good price for American farmers. This is crazy to me. Can you imagine the President of the United States getting up to address the nation and making it a national priority to go to some far-flung place to secure some natural resource that is really important for economic growth. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. Yeah, I mean, it's not that weird, I guess. Um, so yeah, this is becoming a geopolitical issue. The president is involved. They want all the guano. President Fillmore says, quote, nothing will be omitted on my part in the effort to secure this magical, life-giving bird shit. Okay, actually, he didn't say that last part. The, the quotation should have ended, like, like, up here. I just sort of paraphrased the rest. The point is, President Fillmore was serious about this issue. He was gonna get his guano at any cost. So he did what you do when you're a rising superpower, and he promised to send in warships to these Peruvian islands if he had to, in order to secure guano at a good price. Even though Peru rightfully had sovereignty over these islands, and yet, here's a president sending in warships in order to secure the resource. Again, kind of sounds familiar. America is addicted to oil. But American lawmakers in Congress had another answer to this problem, which would allow Americans to get their own guano islands. The proposed law said that any American citizen, not a government official or a military personnel, could go out on their boat anywhere in the ocean, and if they stumble upon one of these rocks that's covered in calcified bird poop, they could claim it, not just for themselves, but for the country of the United States. No treaties, no negotiations, no official declaration, no government involvement even. Just American citizens out on their boats looking for bird poop islands. Some lawmakers at the time were understandably uneasy with this law. Now remember that the US was expanding a lot at this time. Remember that video I made about Mexico and how they're sort of taking over Texas and California and that whole area? Yeah, that's happening around this time. But the US hadn't moved beyond this landmass, this contiguous shape that we think of when we think of the United States. Yeah, we had moved west, but we hadn't gone for far-flung colonies far into the Pacific Ocean. And secondly, the lawmakers are like, since when do we let just like random American citizens go out and like help us colonize islands anywhere in the world? This would set a precedent that these lawmakers were worried would have way bigger consequences than just like letting people go get fertilizer for their farms. The sponsor of this bill, who was trying to get it through Congress, came out and said, listen guys, you're overreacting. This isn't like legit imperialism. We're not like going out and like taking over whole countries like the British or the French were doing, carving up continents. No, no, no. We're just going to these rocks to get some fertilizer for our farms. It's harmless. And this was apparently enough to convince the critics. 
and this law passes the Guano Islands Act of 1856, where literally any American can go help expand the United States by claiming guano islands and mining this stuff and bringing it back to the United States. And so now a giant blitz of guano exploration begins by American citizens. Sort of like the gold rush, but you know, for, for bird poop. Soon, these claims start rolling into the US government. Random guy X from Nebraska sailed to a random island in the Pacific, planted an American flag, and now it belongs to the United States of America. All in all, by the end, there were 94 separate islands, mainly in the Pacific and the Caribbean. The guano was chipped away, harvested, put on ships, brought back to the United States, and farmers thrived. But you know who didn't thrive? The people who had to mine this stuff. I mean, you can imagine. Being the person who has to go onto these islands where you have thousands and thousands of years worth of layers of bird droppings, to drill and cut that away, and to bring it onto a ship to be shipped back to the United States, it's just like excruciating to think about. This was a pretty horrendous job, and it came with all sorts of side effects, like lung issues or running out of food because you're not on an island that grows food, you're on a literal like rock. And so the food would go bad in these ships and the people would be like stranded at sea. Unsurprisingly, these guano barons would trick people into coming with them on these expeditions. In the case of the Pacific, they would often target Hawaiians to recruit for these jobs. And in the case of the Caribbean, they would often target black Americans recently freed from slavery to come work on these guano ships. As some members of Congress at the time worried, the Guano Act had ramifications well beyond guano and fertilizer. In fact, guano became totally obsolete a few years later in the early 1900s when a German chemist invented perhaps the most important invention of all time, which was synthetic fertilizer a way to actually make fertilizer without having to get it from like animal waste. This allowed the population to grow to what it is today and really changed the history of humanity. But what it did is it made guano obsolete. And yet this law that allows Americans to take over random islands and the islands themselves remained on the books. But eventually with time, these claims for random rocks in the Pacific and Caribbean sort of just withered away and we either withdrew the claims or people forgot about them and they were eventually claimed by local countries like Kiribati or Tonga and places like Haiti in the Caribbean. But a few of these guano islands that we originally claimed remain today. We still own them. They're still a part of our borders in both the Pacific and the Caribbean. But the US government isn't interested in using them for guano anymore, obviously. These mostly uninhabited rocks in the ocean are mainly used by the US military for landing strips and seaports. They also serve to help the US with their ocean borders because international law says that if you have a piece of island, you get a big swath of ocean around it for your exclusive economic zone. Meaning the country who owns this island has exclusive economic rights in all of this ocean around their islands. So this greatly enhances the US's ability to have sovereignty and control over certain parts of the ocean in the Pacific and Caribbean. But perhaps the most important result from this guano fest was a psychological one. Like we talked about before, the US was expanding, but it hadn't expanded beyond this contiguous landmass in North America that it was taking over rapidly in the 1800s. But soon after this law is passed, suddenly the US had possessions in faraway oceans. And what happens after this is a domino effect. Suddenly, if we can take over islands in the Pacific, why can't we annex Hawaii or occupy Cuba or Puerto Rico or take over an entire country of the Philippines from Spain? This law that allowed Americans to claim islands all over the world was the first step towards real big boy empire behavior. And it all started with the hunt for bird shit. Thanks for watching my video about bird shit. I wanna tell you about Squarespace. They sponsored today's video and I'm really grateful for that. But I'm also really grateful that they have this really cool service on the internet where you can build a website 
using really beautiful templates and integrations with tons of tools like email marketing, social integration, analytics, everything that is just really useful for running an online business or portfolio or just having a creative presence online. Squarespace just makes it easy. It's like a one-stop shop. I've used Squarespace for many years, long before they came to sponsor a video. And that's why I'm excited to partner with them and promote them because I really believe in the service. So if you are looking to either start an online presence or revamp your online presence, I really recommend Squarespace to do this. There's a link in my description that when you click helps support this channel, but it also gives you an offer of 10% off any purchase you make on Squarespace. So you can go get hosting or a domain name or whatever you need and you'll get 10% off if you click that link. And thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Thank you all for watching. Um, I am making a lot of these US expansion videos because there's so much to cover and so many parts of the story and I want to piece it together in this series. So I'm gonna keep doing it and eventually we'll have like loads of videos of how the US grew to the shape that it is today. So keep an eye out for more of that and I will talk to you soon. See you later.